So, with Mayu now missing, I would normally feel inclined to immediately go searching for her. But after that fight with Miyako, there are a few new items that spawned inside the house. The first of which is actually hidden right back here in the bookcase. Yeah, it's our first entry regarding the folklorists. Seems that he was investigating this village and the ritual that went on here. And much like Himuro Mansion, there apparently was another gate to hell here in the village. And there was something of a forbidden ritual to, that took place that I guess was used to keep the gates of hells closed. So I'm sure we're going to be finding out more about that. I assume that's why they would be bringing it up. And our next point of interest is something that we can actually get later on, but I figure since we're here, we might as well go ahead and get it. It's actually right behind this very large kimono stand here. Just a little hidden ghost. And while it doesn't make a whole lot of sense right now, it will definitely make sense in a couple chapters from now. But otherwise, there aren't any items here on the second floor, so let's go ahead and make our way down to the first floor and, I don't know, hopefully catch up with Mayu. It seems that some mysterious force is pulling Mayu further and further into the village, and we'll be following along with her soon enough. First off though, we already see another item waiting here in the sunken fireplace room. And it's a very important item because it's our first... Well, they call them power-up lenses, but these were basically the auxiliary functions in the previous game. They do have some differences from the previous game. In this case, we don't actually use the... Uh, spirit orbs as ammunition. Instead, we just kind of build up power over time. We'll be seeing what the slow lens does soon enough. But here we also see that we can get additional functions for our camera. In this case, we got the measure function, which now allows us to see the HP of any ghosts we're fighting. Not horribly important, but it can be helpful. But Pretty much every room of the house now has some new things to, gra to grab. In this case, in the tatami room here. No new items, but we do have a little hidden ghost here in the netting. Nothing really else in here. I think our next point of call is going to be the kimono room. I 
Uh -huh. We have an item on the ground here. And it's actually even more herbal medicine. How great. What's not so great is a brand new enemy, the woman in a box. Now, while she isn't very slow, you may notice that there are only a few key opportunities to actually attack her. And one of those is, well, trying to lead her into an attack and trying to have her grab at Mio. Not really the safest position, but it's better than trying to wait for a zero shot normally. The thing is, though, that she does something a little bit different once she gets down to about a tenth of her health. <laughs> yeah, once she gets down to really low health, she'll just decide to madly rush at you and her normal fatal frame opportunity just kind of goes away. But by defeating her, she does leave behind a very valuable item. No, it's not the Moonstone. It's actually another Spirit Orb. So, with a number of points under our belt and a couple of Spirit Orbs, I think we can go ahead and explain the camera upgrade system. But first, let's go ahead and listen to the Moonstone. of the darkness that seems to permeate the village, but I get a feeling it means more than just the night that's uh, clouding the skies. But let's go ahead and look at the camera upgrade system. It's a tad bit different from the first game. Here on the camera screen we can see all of our additional functions, which we have none, our film that we have equipped, and our equipped functions. Now the equipped functions is those power-up lenses we got, so we only have one for right now. But more importantly, we will actually want to go over to the function upgrades and take a look at, well, the system they have in place. So you may notice that there are three places for orbs along with each of the basic functions and the power-up functions, and that's actually where we place the spirit orbs. Now, you can't just straight up put points into things. You actually have to place the spirit orbs ahead of time before you can actually power up anything. So you can't just try to accrue as many points as you want, you actually have to get spirit orbs and the points. Now the basic functions haven't really changed, they're actually the exact same from the first game. And I think what we're going to actually power up first is sensitivity, as it will give us more damage and will increase the range we can actually capture ghosts. Oddly enough, range actually doesn't increase the range, but rather the capture area of the viewfinder itself. Also, since we do have one more additional orb and enough points, we might as well go ahead and add a point into Accumulation, which increases the amount of spirit power we can have. But once we place those spirit orbs, we can now safely upgrade these functions. And now, hopefully, we are a little bit better equipped to take care of whatever dangers lay ahead because we will definitely be seeing more enemies as we progress through this particular chapter.
Now I think our next course of action is to head back to the back room. And not before running into another new enemy. This is the Man in Darkness. He is pretty much the bound man of this particular game. He's not really that fast, he doesn't do that much damage, and he's actually pretty passive. But what I was trying to do there was show off the powered or the power up lens that we have right now, but well sadly I kind of misstepped and really didn't take into consideration the range that he his attacks have. We do have another willing occupant waiting behind us. So as I bring up the viewfinder yet again, if you look in the lower left hand corner you may notice a particular symbol and two little orbs. That is actually the power up lens we're using. After I use slow on him to slow him down, you may notice one of the orbs is now emptied out. But after we do damage to him and get the points, it will actually add to the meter which is pretty much how we use the power-up lenses. The more damage you do, the more attacks you do, the more uh, well, spirit power you get back, and the more you're able to use those powered-up lenses. In this case, the slow lens actually only uses one of the orbs, but as we continue on, some power-ups will actually use up to three or four orbs at a time. Just something good to keep in mind, and I think it's especially a nice little upgrade rather than having to deal with a expendable ammo type. But waiting in the back room here, we find Miyako yet again, looking for her Masumi. And while she doesn't actually give us points, she still adds to our spirit list, so it's a good idea to go ahead and snap a picture of her. But most importantly of all is this item waiting on the deck here. Yeah, we actually find some of the notes that Masumi made while he was kind of scouting around the village. And these are actually part of a larger side quest that we are going to have to try to do to, well, hopefully 100% our spirit list. In this case, he kind of vaguely describes some areas of the village, but some of the notes are only half there. So in our journeys, we're going to hopefully find out what areas he was talking about and maybe find the rest of these reports that he wrote. But for right now, I think it might be a little bit more important to finally go chase after Mayu and, I don't know, make sure she doesn't get into any horrible danger. Before we go, there is one final item to pick up. And this is actually a very special spirit stone in that it does give us some insight in the Mayu. So let's go ahead and give a little listen to that and see if we can't figure out what's going on with our sister. I definitely get a feeling it might be good to catch up with Mayu as quickly as possible. And 
that means now we actually have a little bit of an extended opportunity to, well, explore the village. As opposed to Himuro Mansion, the village is actually pretty expansive and will require quite a bit of backtracking and a little bit of time consuming. But we actually have a pretty direct path we need to take right now, but first I'm going to hang on this wall for no apparent reason. Or for actually a very important reason, because there's a very naughty, naughty vanishing ghost here. Yeah, the butterfly chaser is pretty much the bane of your spirit list if you're trying to hunter percent the game. Mostly because the range on catching that ghost and the timing can be just incredibly, incredibly strict. But if you use these two planks here, it's actually a little bit easier. Otherwise, though, we are, I think, pretty much clear sailing the chase after Mayu here. Sadly, she is very deaf to our pleading under the control of those Crimson Butterflies. And speaking of Crimson Butterflies, that is exactly what we see as we take a picture of the door here. And as you can probably assume, if we actually try the door, we will find that it is locked. But it is a very special lock. Because in this case, it's actually going to require two different keys to open up. So I guess that means we're going to have to just explore the village a little bit more. Here they are. But before we do that, we're going to have to deal with even more new enemies. Yeah, as opposed to Fatal Frame 1, Fatal Frame 2 is not afraid to have you assaulted by multiple enemies at once, and in this case, these particular enemies will always attack you in pairs. This gentleman here is the Seeker. Not too difficult, but these enemies have a rather nasty knack of trying to flank you and trying to attack you from both sides, while being incredibly passive to the point where you actually have to actively go after them. But, as you saw, they don't have a lot of health, and really the Seeker has very small range. The one you have to actually worry about most is this Pole Bear, as he has probably the most range out of both of them. But, after you have both of them dispatched, we can go ahead and pick up some hidden items here. And there's another hidden item by the tree over here. Yeah, it seems like they are just throwing herbal medicine at us left and right. Kind of a good indication for just how much combat is going to be waiting for us ahead. But, much like we saw in the picture we took of the door, mysterious crimson butterflies have now appeared in front of us, and they seem to be directing us right back to where we had just left. But instead of leading us back to the house that we just left, they actually lead us down the other fork in the road, where we can snap up a quick hidden ghost. And we're right around the corner. We seem to find ourselves at another dead end. 
Before we investigate over there, though, you may recall that one of Masumi's notes mentioned a well, and, well, if we investigate this well right here, we actually find his first note. Now, in this particular note, he just goes over basically what he sees, which is a very empty village with pitch black darkness, but more importantly, he goes over the fact that there were four prominent families in the village, and each one of them was actually connected to the Kurosawa name, who pretty much reigned over the entire ceremony that was pretty much the focal point of the village. It all goes to the fact that, well, we actually want to go to the Kurosawa house at some point. So, after we pick up that note, we see that Masumi has appeared where he left that note. And he will not actually appear there, and we will not actually be able to pick up that note had we not gone to the deck earlier. It can be a pretty easy set of vanishing ghosts to miss, but we'll cover that just a little bit for right now. We actually see that the butterflies weren't leading us to a dead end, but an easily missed tiny door with an octagonal symbol on it. Might as well go ahead and head in and see what's waiting for us. Yai! What are you still doing here? Who are you? The ritual will begin soon. If that happens... So we meet a mysterious young man. I'd say he was probably the first normal person we've run into, but he seems a bit out of place and he seems to think that we're someone we're not. Thankfully though, he actually does want to be helpful to us and he's making mention that there are apparently keys locked away in these statues that I brought up in the previous update. Yai! The ritual is about to start! Hurry! He also seems pretty concerned for our sister, even though he might be mistaken. So we might as well snap a quick photo of him. I'm sure he won't mind. So though we need to snap a quick photo of this twin deity statue here, Because even though it shows us just more crimson butterflies, in this case, it's actually supposed to be hinting to us that now there will be particular twin deity statues with crimson butterflies around them. Those are the ones we're going to need to find, but as you've probably been recalling through our trips through the village, there have been quite a few of them, and only two of them are the correct ones. If you cannot find a way to leave the village, come and find me. I may be able to help. And we will be visiting this young boy again, but for right now I have a good idea just where we need to head. And we're actually going to go ahead and kill two birds with one stone by trying to visit some of the locations that the geologist mentioned while also trying to find those twin deity statues. I think the first nearby location that we could probably visit was where we actually entered the village in the first place, which was that weird little ritual stand up on the hill. Now while we head up there, I, I do want to say I actually do like the layout of the village, and oh yeah, hidden item. It actually shows us the layout of the village pretty well in areas that we will visit or have visited before, such as the window where that boy was locked away. Or as we head further and further up the hill here, we actually get a pretty clear view of the entire village. But 
I think the area that the geologist mentioned was actually the little Shinto gates over here. And by investigating, we do find even more records from the surveyor. In this case, he just kind of goes over the fact that he ran into much the same problem that Miyu and Mayu had. But he also has seemingly found out about the fact that, well, this was definitely a place of sacrifice, but the offering stone in the center here was also used to cover up something very, very large. Not actually sure what that might be, but I get a feeling we're going to find out later. And much like the first note that we found from Asumi as we walk away, Pops up yet again for some easy points. Yeah, just getting a closer look. That is definitely a pretty big cover for something. Kind of makes you wonder. As we continue around the outside here, we do find a twin deity statues with some crimson butterflies floating about. And while visually it looks pretty much the same, if we actually investigate this particular one, we'll find that there is a little hidden compartment with a key. Not too difficult. But, as we head away from the statue, we get another visit from the disgruntled villagers, but this time they brought a third pal. This guy is the Sickle Bearer. He is pretty much exactly like the Seeker. But, as you can probably assume, it just becomes even more dangerous when you have three different enemies trying to flank you. That's why it does help that if you can try to get multiple enemies at one try, it's always good to go for that, but well, more than anything, it's better just to whittle and kill one at a time rather than trying to worry about getting the most points with these guys. Especially as you can see, they're very slow and, yet again, they're just not very aggressive. So you can kind of see there that you really do want to go for zero shots, it's just doing normal shots really doesn't do that much damage. But also, after we have killed that little ambush there, we do find a mysterious item as appeared next to the stump here. And it's yet another spirit orb. This is especially helpful because early on your camera is a tad bit underpowered. The problem then becomes of just really getting enough points to well, fill in all these expensive power-ups. But before we head back down the hill, there's a path over here that I did not look into before, mostly because, well, Mayu and Miyu would not have gone down here without a flashlight, and well, I can completely understand, as this would have been pretty dark had we not had the flashlight. Seemingly a very empty little patch of land. Kind of hard to make out what it is initially, but I don't know. It seems very detached from the rest of the village. Also here we find possibly the largest tree in the village. And at the root here, it seems like there's a little bit of a passageway. 
Sadly, at this time, though, we actually can't go in there just yet, but we will be visiting there later on. But as we do head further and further down the path, we figure out just why this patch of land was detached from the rest of the village. And that's because it seems to be a cemetery. Now, this is a purely optional area for right now. There are just a few items to pick up. Nothing too important. Here we just have a new spirit stone. Actually, go ahead and give that a little bit of a listen. There is no time. Just one of them must suffice. Hurry, for the village. We must perform the ritual ourselves. Kill her. Kill her. Kill her. Possibly a little bit more information on that forbidden ritual, but it also seems that Mayu's charm has maybe gotten a little bit more information. is pretty much outlining where we are going to be going to next. But there is just one final item to pick up for in the cemetery for right now. And while not necessary, it can be pretty helpful as it is yet another spirit orb. But with nothing else left to do in the cemetery, I think it's good to get the hell out of this place. grabbing of that key up on the hill has stirred the spirits of the village and that means there are more chances to be attacked now than before. And by looking down this fork here we see yeah we have a little bit of an ambush waiting for us. Not especially dangerous just very meandering. More than anything, the only real difficulty with those particular enemies is just their ability to flank. But by defeating them, we are rewarded with yet another radio stone and in addition, yet another spirit orb. They were really wanting to make sure early on that you had plenty of opportunities to upgrade your camera if need be the case. So, I might as well oblige them since we have been getting plenty of points. So, I think this time around I'll go ahead and increase the range of our camera. And I might as well go ahead and increase the accumulation since we will be using plenty of those power-up lenses later on. And since we did get another radio stone, we might as well go ahead and give that a little bit of a listen. Enough. 
not to insects. There is no meaning. So we now see that twins are important to the ritual, that someone was killed, and we got some new term there, kusabi. Hmm. All additional pieces of the puzzle. But for right now, we actually only have one other area of the village to explore. And we'll actually have covered pretty much 80% of the village. You may recall, basically down at this fork right here where we caught the butterfly chaser, that there was another little road that we could head down. And that's actually where we're going to head right now. And this is actually where we could see from all the way on top of Masano Hill. So it's actually all coming together rather nicely. And it seems we don't actually actually uh, seems we actually don't have to go too far as the crimson butterflies are actually right at this little uh, bend in the road. But, as before, once we get that key, we are given another little bit of an ambush. This one, in retrospect, is actually a lot simpler than the villagers. It's just another three men in the dark. And as I said before, until you get within a certain range, they're actually just pretty chill. The thing is, though, this particular duo right here is a little bit different from the guy we just killed. Even though we managed to do well, the same amount of damage we just did to the previous guy, these guys seem to have a little bit more health than the other one. Otherwise, they're the exact same and honestly not really a threat. say that and then get attacked, but yet again, their attack range is a little bit disconcerting. Now, even though we have gotten both keys, you may notice that the path doesn't end here. And we are still missing a few nuts from the surveyor, so we might as well go ahead and explore the rest of the outside of the village here. And hopefully get the rest of those uh, surveyor notes. Another mysterious vision out of the way, we have a long winding set of stairs to go up, but well, I think before we go up these long set of stairs, there is a little bit of a short path left to go here in the fork. And, well, it's actually just a pretty scenic little area right here. Well, until we get assaulted by villagers yet again. Much like in Fatal Frame 1, there are random encounters in case you are taking a little bit more time than the game feels you need to take. Thankfully at this point in the game, all the game is really going to throw at us are these villagers and really they're just an easy means to get points. With them out of the way, this is actually another one of the locations that the surveyor mentioned. Yeah, our point of interest is actually this little pinwheel here amongst all the little statues. Yeah, 
Yeah, our point of interest is the single twin deity statue here. And in the surveyor's notes, he actually makes mention of these twin deity statues. Now, they obviously have some part in the ritual, but the thing that struck the surveyor as most odd is the fact that for some reason, one of the twins in the statues all have a missing head. I'm not actually sure what that could mean, but... Well, it definitely makes the surveyor feel very uncomfortable, let alone the fact of the eternal night that seems to be permeating the village, so... He definitely seems even more motivated, motivated to try to find a way out of the village. Also, this path doesn't continue on for too much longer, and instead dead ends at that same very large tree we saw before. So as you can probably guess, this tree is going to be something of a shortcut, perhaps for later on in the game. But at the top of the stairs here is our final destination on our trip through the outskirts of the village. We do get a nice sacred water for our troubles. And in addition, as we get closer to the door, we do find that there is a hidden ghost on the beaten path here. More importantly, outside of that hidden ghost, is if we actually investigate the doors of this building here. We actually find that this is the last location that the surveyor had mentioned in his notes. Here he just goes over the fact that this is actually something of a small, but well kept up little temple. And that... Perhaps the butterflies that are mentioned in the ritual might mean something other than just butterflies. Also, as you can probably assume yet again, we do have another vanishing ghost of the Surveyor here. But, as this is the final location, after we take a picture of him, we actually get a yeah, mysterious hidden report. In this one, it actually shows the distress that has really come about from being in the village for too long. How long, he's not really sure, but Miyako is now utterly exhausted. And it, well, kind of goes to show that they were actually together here for quite some time, but ended up being split up. As Masumi decided to go exploring, probably to the Kurosawa house, to try to find some way out of the village. He does make some mention of an underground tunnel that seems to connect all the houses in the village, but... I don't know, maybe he's still down in there. But while we are up here, we can actually go ahead inside of the temple and get a little investigating done. And we see that even though Masumi said it was pretty well kept up, at this particular point, it's definitely seen better days. Already though, you can see there are quite a few items for us to go ahead and pick up. First though, this altar in the center here kind of catches my interest. kind of wonder what that thing is on the table there. Ah, we have definitely become familiar with mirrors, but I don't think this one is the same mirror from the first game. I think it might just be something completely different. 
we do get another spirit orb. And we see that there is an item hidden away behind the latus here. Yeah, I think we are already up to about five or six sacred water at this point, but there is one more point of interest hidden away behind the latest here, which is this talisman covered door. Yeah, it doesn't really serve a function right now, but it is a good point of reference to know that it is there. But that may seem like we have gathered all the items in this temple, but there is actually one hidden away item in these little vases here. And it is even more healing items. And that is actually all we can do in the this little temple for right now. But normally you're actually supposed to be attacked in here after you do a certain number of things, but... Well, I kept trying to get it to trigger, but for some reason or another, I guess I just wasn't hitting the right triggers. Not really a big concern, it is a, as it is an enemy we'll be seeing later, and we have actually gotten into, I think, quite enough fighting for this particular update, so... Well, I mean, we, we have the two keys we need, so let's go ahead and finish our chase after Mayu. Now, if you recall what we heard from Mayu's charm, it's through a big door, along a long bridge, into a big house. Yeah, that right there is the Kurosawa residence, and we'll be heading to that in just one second. First, though, before we actually do cross the bridge, off to the side here, we can find a hidden away little item. But this particular bridge is called Whisper Bridge, and I'll see if you can see why. Say hello to the sunken woman. Her drowned cries and the bubbles surrounding the air definitely give you the apprehension that well, I'm gonna say she was a drowning victim. But as an enemy, she's not terribly hard. She'll take damage and then teleport around. And she'll actually give you a good chance for a zero shot from very far away. Uh, outside of that, I mean. She can be a bit hard to follow around, but she's really not that difficult. Might as well go ahead and show off her attack at least once. But really, nothing too much to write home about. 
After defeating her, though, we do get another item. You can probably guess what this is at this point, but, well, it's another radio stone. And another spirit orb. Also, this nearby hole here actually has, well, a hidden ghost. You can probably guess who it is. And just to round, out, round off our knowledge of the sunken woman, let's go ahead and listen to her stone. Pretty terrifying thought to have in your head. The endless water rushing in, the suffocation, the drowning. So let's just keep on pushing forward and let's just get off this bridge. We finally get a first-hand listen to that maniacal laughter we've heard mentioned before, along with that woman in white that I think we saw with Mayu. Also, we get an up-close view of the very expansive Kurosawa house. Seems like it'll be... it'll probably take quite some time to explore. So, I think this is probably a good a time as any to call it an update. Hopefully you'll join me next time as we head inside. See you then.